Hey hey, Marcus House with you here and today a super exciting episode because I'm going to simulate for you the very mission that you've all been asking for since NASA's surprise announcement about potentially using commercial launch providers to replace the space launch system in some future missions. Not only this though, I'm very lucky to be joined here by the very awesome Shadow Zone. Hello everybody and welcome Shadow Zone over here and thanks Marcus for inviting me on this ride. <laughs> no problem mate, thanks for joining in. Now we've been researching and tinkering with some potential commercial missions here and I think we can all agree that a Falcon Heavy is going to be the obvious choice to launch say the Exploration 1 mission by 2020. I think it goes without saying that there's no other viable solution out there that's going well, to- Well hang on Terry, just a minute. No other viable solution? <laughs> Have you forgotten the rocket that Orion has already flown on? That was the Delta IV Heavy, which means it surely must be the preferred choice to get Orion into space. Space. Ah yes, but there's a lot more than just the Orion spacecraft. To complete the Exploration 1 mission you need to also have the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage or ICPS for the translunar injection burn to kick it from a low Earth orbit up to fly by the moon before it gets decoupled. Oh, you mean the ICPS that also goes by its acronym DCSS? Oh, you know <laughs> that stands for Delta Cryogenic Second Stage? It basically is already part of a Delta IV rocket, so once again easier to get on that launcher. Okay, I see what you're getting at, but the Delta IV Heavy has nowhere near the power to get both these vessels to orbit. Yeah, I grant you that, but that's why we just need to launch two Delta IV Heavies. <laughs> well, that sounds logistically difficult. Surely it's much more likely that SpaceX can just whack both of these suckers on a Falcon Heavy and off we go. Whack is about right. Remember when I already talked about the possibility of using a Falcon Heavy for EM1 in one of my videos? One of the tricky points will be the size of the payload. SpaceX's fairings are just too small. Fairing? Where we're going, we don't need fairings because we can just make a custom adapter to cover the ICPS and then shove the entire Orion vehicle with its launch escape system right on top and away we go. No problem. Ooh, that seems precarious. <laughs> you reckon the aerodynamic stresses are not going to fold that whole thing in half? And how the hell are you going to fuel the ICPS up there with liquid hydrogen? SpaceX only use kerosene and then also what about Okay, okay, I see that you've got some objections here. So let's see how I go and then you can try and do all this with Delta IV heavies. For now, I'm going to demonstrate that the Falcon Heavy is the superior and obvious choice for the Exploration 1 mission. How does that sound? <laughs> Sounds like a challenge. You're going to eat my Delta dust. Anyway, let's do this. Okay, so the very first thing that we need to understand is the maximum payload capability of the Falcon Heavy. Now it's very clearly stated on the SpaceX website that the Falcon Heavy has got a payload capability to low Earth orbit at around 63 tons. Let's round this down. This is of course in fully expendable mode which means that we're going to throw away all three of our booster cores. Now here I have created for you an Orion replica along with the ICPS module down the bottom. This is around 60 tons total. That includes the launch escape system, the little tower there at the top. Now the ICPS, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, is essentially a modified DCSS as Shadow Zone said earlier. This entire vessel should be around that 30 ton mark. Now if I take that whole ICPS off there, we're left now with around 27 tons there. Now again, this includes that launch escape tower. This is the only thing I'm not 100% sure about. If we have a look at the Orion capsule here, you can see the total is supposed to be around 25 tons. So I'm assuming that this vessel is coming in pretty close to what the specification would be. This whole part here is around 27 tons. So here we go with it mounted on top of the Falcon Heavy. Now, as <laughs> Shadow Zone said there earlier, it does look a little precarious. Obviously, the whole diameter of the Orion capsule is around that five meter mark. The Falcon Heavy, of course, has cores which are around 3.66 meters wide. So it looks a little strange sitting on top here. And uh, as we will see as we launch this massive beast, that the Falcon Heavy does indeed have the thrust to weight ratio and the raw power it needs to push this entire 60 ton payload up off the surface and it will indeed get the entire payload here 
just shy of low Earth orbit. Now, a little disclaimer here. I actually expect that the real Falcon Heavy, based on what we see as the maximum payload for an expendable mission like this, would actually perform slightly better. For whatever reason, and there could be a number of different reasons to do with mods or just my flight profile, I couldn't quite get the same performance that we should be able to see with the real Falcon Heavy. So just take this launch profile with a little grain of salt because the real Falcon Heavy should perform slightly better than this. Now I'm showing you here that the central core has its thrust limited right down to around 36%. The throttle there on the side boost is still pushed way up at 100% and this is what we should see in the very shortly upcoming ArabSat 6A mission. And the whole idea around this is to make sure that that central core burns the smallest amount of fuel possible, which means when those two side boosters come off, the central core booster there is still going to be half full. Now, because this will be an expendable mission, none of these three cores are going to be recovered in any way. The entire vessel is essentially expendable. Now, this is not too much of a problem because we're competing here against other launch providers and all of them are expendable. SpaceX, remember, is the only space agency that has the capability of reusing boosters anyway. And even better than this, Elon Musk tweeted out hmm, a little over a year ago here now that the expendable Falcon Heavy would probably sit around 150 million dollars compared to the much more expensive Delta IV Heavy. And there we go, we have there our booster engine cutoff. Both of those boosters beautifully falling away just like we're going to see here again with ArabSat 6A. The central core now has throttled right up. We're going to burn all the remaining fuel and get this vessel way up to a much higher velocity. Now, just after the side booster cutoff there, we're going to ditch these side panels on the service module, followed very shortly by the launch of the escape tower. We no longer need that. Now we have our central core here almost now out of fuel, just a little remaining. We are getting ourselves right up to an orbital velocity of around 4,200 meters per second. That is huge. Our second stage there kicking off with our single Merlin vacuum engine. This is a massive payload we are pushing here. So you can see we are pointing up on the nav ball quite a lot there, the nav ball down here in the bottom left. So we're doing that just so that we don't start to fall back down past our apoapsis. Now, I'm not overly sure exactly what launch profile will be used on the real EM-1 mission, but I'm potentially here launching much higher than we would in real life. That's just because we don't have the SLS kicking the entire thing to orbit. The SLS obviously would have been much more powerful. So we're going to be sort of rounding out our orbital height here at around 430 kilometers or so. That being said, I'm sure that SpaceX can much better optimize the launch profile than I can. Now, you may have also noticed that we have two Kerbals on board down in the bottom right. Kerbals, for those of you that do not play Kerbal Space Program, I can't imagine how many people that would be, <laughs> but the Kerbals here are our little pseudo-astronauts. Now, we have Burberry Kerman, who is the celebrity Kerbal for my channel, and he is down here after a very long holiday, wanting very desperately to sit in on a mission where he has no right to be, because, of course, the real exploration mission one will not have any crew on board it's going to be a test demo mission now we're just coming up here to our second engine cutoff our stage two here almost out of fuel just shy of orbital velocity couldn't quite get it up to full orbital velocity and in fact i did drop a little bit of fuel out of both of these stages simply because we didn't need it all. And as I stated earlier, I just couldn't quite get the same performance from the Falcon Heavy that I felt that we should be able to based on that maximum payload that we see on the SpaceX website. In fact, that second stage should get this easily up to orbit based on what we can see there. So there we go, we are now in orbit after spending around 100 meters per second of Delta V with that stage. So not a great deal, but we do now have plenty of fuel left to do our translunar injection burn here shortly to make us pass up by the moon. Our solar panels are out. We are now collecting and recharging our batteries and just setting up our maneuver nodes here to simulate the best trajectory out to the moon there for our translunar injection burn. 
So as we can see, we need to do almost a full orbit here before we start this burn. The burn time is around 20 minutes for the real mission as it would have been with the SLS. For this uh, mission here, because we're in a lower orbit, slightly longer than that, now I didn't want to do this in one pass because you do lose quite a bit of delta V when doing a burn of that duration because a lot of the time you are actually burning in an offset direction. So what we're going to do here is do two separate burns. The very first burn is going to last roughly 10 minutes, five minutes one side of our maneuver node, five minutes on the other side. That's going to mean that we're not thrusting too far off our direction, at around 15 degrees when we start, 15 degrees when we finish. Now, what we'll do then after that is actually come back around and do a second burn to complete that translunar injection. Now, that second burn will be around that 10 minute mark as well, and this is going to give Burberry Kerman and Valentina Kerman down here, our two pseudo crew, around three hours or so to enjoy the beautiful sights of a elliptical orbit around the Earth, and we'll see that shortly after we complete this first half of the burn. So there we go, that burn is now completed. We now get to do our three hour journey, passing almost 9,000 kilometers from the surface of the Earth up at our highest point, the Apoapsis, right here. And we can see that beautiful sun halo around the Earth as we come back around into the daylight. Just beautiful, those shots that we can get from this Kerbal Space Program simulation. Now, that very first burn that we just completed there was around 1400 meters per second. We're now going to do our next burn here, which is going to be roughly 1750 meters per second. Now, the reason that we're able to do a higher delta V burn in the same amount of time is because the vessel is now lighter. We don't have as much fuel to push, and then this essentially gives us a higher thrust to weight ratio with our vessel. Now, as we get right up here to burn target, I actually ran out of fuel with the ICPS, and this last little bit here is done just using the reaction control system. So, tiny little tweaks here, just to make sure that we are following the mission, the same as specified by the EM-1 mission plan as outlined when it was to be done with the SLS. So we've just popped our little Kerbal here. Burberry is coming out to do a little tour. You can just imagine being in a spacesuit here on a trajectory that's going to take you out past the moon. What a freaky thing that would be. So Burberry Kerman doing a beautiful tour here of our entire Orion vessel and the ICPS. is just gonna pop back in. You just wanted to inspect the little cubes that you might have spotted. Those of you with a keen eye may have spotted the little cubes at the bottom of the vessel here. These are tiny little CubeSats, 13 of them in total. And I believe these are going to be released right throughout the mission of the actual ICPS because it's going to be decoupled at this stage with our main Orion vessel. And these CubeSats will more than likely be separated at different parts in the mission after flying by the moon, that sort of thing. Just to keep this mission moving, I've just decoupled them all there. And uh, I haven't actually decoupled the ICPS yet just because I have a tiny little bit of RCS fuel in here. And I was just going to use that to help me do this little mid-course correction. Now, the idea of the ICPS is for that to actually be disposed of in a heliocentric orbit. So it's going to fly by the moon at this stage, it's going to pass by and be ejected out of the Earth's sphere of influence. So it's just going to orbit around the sun and then potentially stay in that orbit untouched for potentially thousands of years. Now, our Orion capsule and service module together are now within the sphere of influence of the moon. So we're just going to be setting up our retrograde burn here. And the idea with this burn is to bring our apoapsis down just enough so that we remain in the moon's sphere of influence. And this is essentially going to allow us to then later on climb up into a distant retrograde orbit, which is the orbit type used for exploration mission one. And the burn that we just did there was almost to spec as well, just 100 kilometers above the surface of the moon, around 62 miles or so. So after time warping, we can bring our Orion vessel right up to the top of our orbit here, right at the apoapsis. It is then time to actually do our orbit insertion burn to enter the distant retrograde orbit. Now this orbit is actually so high around the moon, it takes 12 whole days to do one full orbit. Now, the actual time spent up in this orbit for the Exploration Mission 1 will only be 
around six days. So they're certainly not going to be able to get all the data that would be provided if we were to say stay up in orbit this long. Instead, what we need to do is wait six days in this high orbit and then do our retrograde burn just a few hundred meters per second to drop back down to pass right over the surface of the moon again. Now, just as we pass the lower point in this orbit, the periapsis, we do an ejection burn, which is going to send us way out of the sphere of influence of the moon and send us back on a trajectory to intercept with the Earth's atmosphere here. Now, with the exception of a slight mid-course correction to make sure that our trajectory is correct, we actually have used all the fuel that we need to use for this mission, and we actually still have over 700 meters per second of Delta V in this service module stage. And of course, now we are decoupling our capsule in preparation for re-entry. And just because I can, I'm actually going to do two passes through the atmosphere. This initial pass is going to bring our apoapsis right down almost to re-entry velocity, but we're just going to be able to just jump out of the atmosphere just a little and do a correction with our RCS to come back down on the light side of the planet. This is only because the timing of the mission wasn't quite right for me to be coming back on the light side of the Earth. So we're just re-entering the atmosphere here now for the second time, screaming in in a blistering 7,700 meters per second, which equates to around 27,700 kilometers per hour. That is orbital velocities, ladies and gentlemen. That is the International Space Station screaming overhead every day. Uh, of course, as soon as we get into the thicker part of the atmosphere, we pull out those drogue chutes to slow our descent even further. And then, of course, as we slow ourselves even more, we can pull out the main chutes here, which are going to allow us to touch our craft down nice and gently into the ocean, a nice gentle splashdown. So there you go, boys and girls, that is a clear-cut success with absolutely no drawbacks whatsoever. Zero risk, single launch, no problem. Falcon Heavy! Uh, zero risk? That thing looks pretty unstable. You think the Falcon Heavy can control that thing at max Q? Ah, uh, yes, yes I do. Merlin engine vectoring for the win? Well, if you think you can do this mission better with Delta IV heavies, let's continue this experiment over on your channel and we will see which one really is the better SLS replacement. <laughs> this is going to be fun.